Hi, this is Andy LeBeau of Commodity Research Group. We are thrilled to have as our guest today on the podcast, one of the real stars of the energy field, Amy Jaffe. Amy is currently a research professor at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. During her long distinguished career in both the public and private sectors, she has become known as a leading expert on global energy policy, energy sustainability, and geopolitics. Amy has a new book out entitled Energy's Digital Future, Harnessing Innovation for American Resilience and National Security, available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Amy, thanks so much for joining us and congratulations on the book. Great to be here with you, Andy. Amy, I love the book. Any book that could take you on a journey from Henry Ford to Elon Musk is well worth the trip. I have to tell you, for anyone who's interested in where we were, where we are, and where we're going in the energy space, I would really urge you to read this book. Amy, you focus on a number of themes in the book. Uh, You talk about energy innovation, energy transition, and the geopolitical consequences of the new digital energy world. And we're going to talk about all these themes uh, during the podcast. But let's start in the past. In the book, you describe a real opportunity missed at the dawn of the gasoline age. Tell us about the incredibly interesting and really little known story of Thomas Edison and Henry Ford. Well, I I think that people don't really know. I mean, people know that Edison Ford were incredible innovators and inventors at the turn, the last turn of the century. And indeed, it was a very transformative period. And, you know, Henry Ford developed this assembly line process that revolutionized manufacturing. Edison was, uh, you know, responsible for, you know, basically our entire electricity system. But the interesting thing is, that they collaborated to try to pull together a electric battery that would be suitable uh, for automobiles and at, for, the, for the Model T. And at the time, it was a really you know, interesting thing because we all think about this narrative that we've been told that you know, gasoline was the superior technology and that's why we're all in gasoline cars. Uh, but that wasn't actually true at the time of Ford and Edison. Uh, At the time of Ford and Edison, actually, you know, the way people got around all across big cities in the United States was by electric vehicle. And indeed, there were these very efficient electric taxi services, sounds a little bit like Uber, where you would call the taxi company on your telephone, you know, and, uh, and they would come and pick you up in an electric car. And then when the battery would get low, the driver would go back to the central depot and they would switch out the battery for one that was charged. So realistically, you know, the entire sort of transportation vehicle fleet back in the day was electric, you know, 1910, peak, peak electricity for cars. And then on, a t- on top of that, we had electric collie. We had electric trolleys in major cities. And so electrification of transportation, which we're now talking about, like this unbelievably difficult task we're going to undertake, we were electrified. So, you know, and people say, well, you know, gasoline was just so much more efficient, but actually gasoline cars were unbelievably problematic. People, when you you hear the expression people use today that someone is cranky, you know, that comes from the fact that you used to have to crank your gasoline car to turn it on. And people, it was so hard to do that people would literally break their arms from the kickback and other problems with the car. And there were all kinds of problems. You used to not, they didn't used to be safe gasoline stations. You used to actually pick up gasoline at the grocery store. Um, and so, you know, there were stories from back in the day of people literally blowing themselves up, trying to fill their own car with gasoline. So it was really a pretty imperfect technology. And of course, there's a famous story where Henry Ford wanted to promote his car. Um, So he wanted to get the famous uh, environmentalist James Burrow to drive the car. So Burrow uh, took possession of the car 
and tried to drive it and actually crashed into his barn. Um, so it was, you know, they were not easy. And then, you know, people would drive out with these cars, these gasoline cars, and uh, the axle of the car would break from bumps on the road. And so they'd be stranded. So it really was not a superior technology uh, at the time the, when the Model T first came out. And indeed, not only did Ford and Edison try to come up with an electric vehicle, but years later, Henry Ford was quoted as saying that he regretted that his cars ran on gasoline, that that was going to be a major problem for vehicles in the future, and that he wanted to see his car shift to some other fuel because he designed the car to be a vehicle for people in the rural countryside. So it was clear how many of us, you know, thousands of electric car companies, including the Baker electric car that serviced people in cities. So Henry Ford's idea was that out in the countryside in America where electricity was still not prevalent, he would create a car that ran on biofuels. And eventually, you know, he was convinced to switch to gasoline. But the bottom line is the first, even the first Model Ts were dual fuel vehicles. So to me, it's very instructive to go back and look at that period of history. You know, what happened to the Ford Edison collaboration on batteries? Well, one of the problems was that the whole battery industry was torn asunder during World War I because so many of the metals involved in battery manufacturing were needed for ammunition and other military uh, supplies. So that was a big factor in uh, hindering uh, the continued competition of electric cars with gasoline vehicles. And the second thing that happened is that the US government uh, requisitioned Henry Ford and others who were manufacturing vehicles to supply trucks for the effort of our allies in Europe because Germany in World War I controlled the uh, rail lines for logistics. And so uh, the allies needed to switch to trucking to be able to have a, a leg up. And America supplied ambulances, supplied trucks. And so, and, and Ford switched some of his manufacturing to provide uh, support for airline, uh, jet plane manufacturing. So, so it was really like a crucial period in history where the national security imperative of the war pushed us out of electric cars. And, you know, there's a little bit of a tragedy in that because now when you hear people from the current tech industry, you know, talking about developing autonomous self-driving robot cars that are going to be able to deliver food without human beings and are going to be able to, you know, serve as like taxis in Manhattan and they could be electrified and that'll be less polluting and, and, and better for air quality. And that'll be low, low, no carbon emissions and it will uh, be a better society. The sad thing is, had we not gone to gasoline vehicles, had we stayed on the taxi system that we had, say, in New York City, where they were electric, and we still had electric trolleys, then the transition to clean electricity would have been a snap. And all the infrastructure we would have had for vehicles and uh, light rail would still be electrified. That is an unbelievable uh, ama uh, just an amazing story because I don't, I don't think many of us, I mean, I, I've been in energy my whole career and I had no idea that uh, the electric vehicle w was so advanced in the, in the 1910s uh, and, in and into the 1920s. And here we are, uh, literally 100 years later, talking almost daily about uh, electric vehicles. And I think this this will lead into and let, me, and let me just make one last point, which is, can you imagine how good the batteries would have been if we'd spent this last hundred years perfecting them instead of perfecting the gasoline engine? Oh, yeah, we, we'd be there, right? We, 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 we would be there. We'd have been there years. a long time. Yeah, we yeah, would have been there a long time in, ago. We would have probably been there in the uh, 1950s. Who yeah, who, yeah knows? who knows? Who knows? Yeah. But unfortunately, th then 20 years after World War, 25 years after World War I, we had World War II. You know, who, who knows if the electric vehicle would have, would have, fought, would have uh, been effective, you know, fighting World War II. 
we won't know, but it is an amazing story. And I think it does segue into, uh, let's move into today and tomorrow, because a, a lot of the book is about uh, energy innovation. And uh, we certainly live in a, in a world where uh, technology is, is remarkable. It's changing the way we live today and will do so tomorrow. And uh, one of the areas where technology has had an enormous impact is uh, in the energy field, of course. And your book is entitled uh, Energy's Digital Future. Can you talk a little bit about some of those uh, developing and developed digital technologies and perhaps how you see them hastening or maybe even hindering the uh, energy transition? Well, let's talk about it. I mean, I, I think one of the interesting things that we've seen is that the COVID pandemic actually accelerated some of the technologies I talked about. So, for example, commuting accounts for about 16% of U.S. oil demand historically. And, you know, pre-COVID, less than 10% of U.S. employees used the telecommuting. But now something like a third of the country uh, uh, are working from home. Some, another portion of people are working from home sometimes. Um, and so that's a big change. And, you know, if you think about longer term, um, if you add to that the fact that, you know, business airline travel is down 70 or 80% from what we were used to. Um, you know, that's a lot of consumers of oil. Uh, that are no longer out there for those specific purposes. Now, some of the, the, the things are more complicated, you know, e-commerce. E-commerce is also, you know, way up since uh, COVID. It grew 44% in 2020. And, you know, here's the thing. People have studied it. And if you, uh, well, if you do, you know, you demand like immediate delivery, you know, maybe not so much, but if you're just, you know, ordering something on a on an e-commerce site and they're delivering it to you, you know, whether it's a big efficient uh, purveyor like an Amazon, and you're not going to the store for those items, right? They're coming to your house. You know, UPS, Amazon, you know, the shippers, they have these digital e e programs, right, where they use an algorithm to figure out what is the most efficient way to get that package to your house. And the first year that UPS used one of these big data programs to schedule deliveries. Um, so it both schedules where, what warehouse to deliver from, it schedules, you know, uh, uh, where the, where the uh, you know, what time, you know, how many packages go in what truck. It even schedules what turns the driver makes. Like drivers are not allowed to just randomly go where they feel like going to deliver these packages. It's all computerized and linked into their um, navigation system. And the first year that UPS did that, they saved 100 million miles. I'm sorry, 100 million miles. Yeah, 100 million miles of vehicle mile travel, just this algorithm alone, right? So again, very powerful way to eliminate oil use, very powerful way to reduce emissions. You know, Amazon and some of the companies are saying they're gonna go to uh, low carbon vehicles, maybe, you know, hydrogen or for big trucks or, or um, electricity uh, for delivery trucks based on, you know, renewable energy. So when we do something like that, you know, huge powerful effect on environmental performance, you know, both for local air quality but also for uh, carbon emissions. So, you know, very powerful technologies. And of course, the big one we all learned about during COVID was 3D printing. So you might recall that we didn't have enough uh, PPE uh, during the initial stages of the crisis. And you had companies donate uh, the time of their 3D printers in Houston and other cities to quickly make um, masks and other kinds of things that people needed uh, using 3D printing. Now, 3D printing is widely used now in the aerospace industry, and it has a huge effect in the following way. Take an average plane, like I use the example of the Cessna Denali, 
They used to have something like 800 or 900 parts that went into that engine. Now they 3D printed eight parts. Now, why does that matter for environment? Um, you know, and people say, well, you know, 3D printing uses more electricity and that's true, but, and there's the but, if you have 800 or 900 parts being manufactured for an engine, you know, and you have a complex supply chain and those parts are being manufactured in different places, you have to ship them to the factory that's going to assemble the engine. And that takes a lot of oil. Uh, academics have studied that and they say, again, just shifting to 3D printing can reduce oil transportation use for goods by up to 30%. So a lot of these technologies have really powerful applications, but you know, it's kind of how you use it. If, if you're jumping into an Uber all the time um, because you don't want to park your own car, or you're maybe you're a person who lives in a city, you don't even have a car. You know, sadly, what the research had shown prior to the crisis was that, you know, a lot of people were taking Uber instead of going into the subway. And therefore, that was making things worse. You had all these gasoline cars cruising around looking for rides and um, a lot of congestion, which wastes fuel um, as you had all these Uber trips stopping and going and delivery vans stopping and going, a lot of congestion in cities. And so that was making the problem worse. So it's really about, you know, not only the, the technology itself, I tell people the technology itself is agnostic. You know, it's how we use the technology, um, whether it's gonna give us a positive result or a negative result. You know, I, I wanna say that you have been talking about 3D printing, I think, even before it was even invented. So it's, it's something that I know is, uh, you know, very close to your, uh, close to your heart. And uh, that, that's, an, that's an amazing stat you threw out because 30% of transport demand is, you know, we're talking about, yeah, I mean, we're talking about multiple million barrels a day. Uh, of uh, global demand, if that's, you know, that's, that's a big that number. Materializes. And, and, you know, the interesting thing is, if you think about like the trade war of recent years, companies really have the incentive now to shrink their supply chain. So not having all their supplies come from one part of the world, or they have to worry about the, you know, pandemic risk somewhere might close down factories somewhere and they'll lose their supplies. And so, you're having this sort of pressure to shorten the supply chain. And indeed, in, um, in, in last year, uh, in 2020, maritime trade was down, you know, almost 5%. So, so that's, you know, one thing. And then, you know, the question is, when will it hit the retail? So maybe we're a little far away from that. But one of the stories I tell in the book is I went to the place where, um, they 3D print Adidas sneakers. And someday you're literally going to be able to print your own sneakers in your house, or you're going to be able to go to a, a retail outlet and tell them what you want for a custom sneaker. And they're going to measure your foot uh, by computer, by you know taking a picture of it, your foot. And then they're going to print out your sneakers, right? And, you know, I don't know how to share the image of what this looks like. You're standing in front of this little machine. It almost looks like a office water cooler or um, coffee maker. And there's a little compartment and it's open. And then a, 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 like a plastic window shuts over this compartment. And then the guy pushes the button from his computer, which has the design for the you know, base of the sneaker. And, you, and I don't know how to describe it to you. It's like goop, you know, comes out into this window magically. And three minutes later, it's the bottom of the sneaker. Come on. And I mean, it, it's, it's, it's hard to describe it because it's <laughs> additive. They call it, that's what they call it, additive manufacturing. So it just piles up the material that you're going to make the sneaker out of, you know, one little layer at a time. Uh, in, it, it really looked like we were in a Walt Disney movie, like Abracadabra. And, you know, in, in, in Europe and other places, 
they have experimented with 3D printing homes and buildings. Like we're not, and you know, as I said, we're, we're 3D printing, you know, jet engines. So it's really just mind blowing to think about what could happen someday. And you could imagine you'd be sitting in your house and you'd say, geez, I'm noticing that my seven-year-old sneakers look a little too small now. And you and he would just sit or she would just sit down at the computer and you would design the sneaker you want and then push a button on your home 3D printer and the sneakers would be there. Now, here's the big thing. When you're talking about sustainability, you know, if you print the sneakers and then a week later you don't like them and you print another pair and you keep printing and printing and printing sneakers and throwing them away, that would be a bad thing, right? So it's, you know, again, same thing, double-edged sword here on the 3D printing. But if you think about American competitiveness, you know, you don't have to have a hundred people to sew the sneakers together if you're going to 3D print it, right? So it's really going to change the relationship between the global South and industrial countries like the United States, because they're going to be items, whether that's industrial items or heavy industrial items, maybe first, but then later retail products that the United States is going to be competitive in again, because we're going to use these advanced manufacturing techniques and robotics, and they won't necessarily create the kind of manufacturing jobs we think about from 10 years ago that moved to a China or an India or a Vietnam, but they're going to create different kinds of jobs. And so that's really, you know, it's hard to even think through how that's going to change society and, and how that's going to change what we do. Well, that leads us really nicely into the next area that, that I wanted to uh, talk about. And uh, one, of, one of the strengths that you bring to your analysis and is key to why I think this book is so important is your uh, background in the geopolitical area. You write a lot about how the digital future will challenge geopolitical norms, particularly when it comes to China. There's a chapter about China in the book, which is, which is really terrific, Amy. Can you elaborate a little bit and talk about how you see the geopolitics playing out in, in the new digital world? Well, I think the first thing about the digital world, which we kind of learned with the attack on Colonial Pipeline. So Colonial Pipeline had moved to automated digital systems, uh, both for billing and for the operation of the pipeline. So, you know, in the old days, there literally were human beings who would turn valves on and off to make deliveries from the pipeline. And of course, that's all automated now. But, you know, that increases the surface area where some ransomware attack or some other kind of attack could take place and try to override, you know, these, these automated or digital systems. So the first thing that's changed geopolitically is that the country that's going to be the most powerful in the world is not necessarily going to be the country that has the largest army or the biggest navy per se, but you know, you're going to have to be superior in this digital cyber space, both on the defensive and the offensive, just to create like a new detente um, to discourage people from cyber attacking you. And then, you know, the, the flip side is, which I go into in the book, you know, how China uses some of these technologies is different than the way these technologies should be used in a, de in a democracy. And therefore, the United States really needs to take a leading role, not only in the developing the, the technologies themselves, because you know, that's good for the US economy and good for jobs and good for our own competitive position economically, but we have to consider to be leading in the world about to avoid what the Biden administration has termed as uh, digital authoritarianism, which is a great way of summarizing it. So in China, you have a system where, you know, here in America, you know, your credit card rating is based on your ability to pay your bills. You know, you, you, you get credit initially from, you know, uh, having an income 
and showing that you pay your bills regularly and then you build up your credit over time. And it can be a little difficult for a, a young person starting out but, um, or for a person who is, uh, starts out with a lower paying job, but, but ultimately the system is based on how you pay your bills. In China, it's a social rating system. So how you pay your bills is you know, part of it, but more importantly, uh, the Chinese look at who are you connected with in social media? What do you do in your daily life? Are you a good citizen in the community where you live? You know, are you a responsible worker in your job? So you can imagine, and they have facial recognition software all over the country. So you can imagine that if you were to go and participate in a protest somewhere and facial recognition captured you, uh, then your social rating would go down. And if you did other things that the government didn't like, your social rating would go down. And so it's sort of like a control mechanism and uh, for repression. And indeed, if the Chinese government decides it doesn't like what you're doing, what you're saying, you know, someday that could be even more frightening because you could be speaking at home if you had Alexa and you were giving her instructions, she's taping you then they're going to know what you're even saying in your privacy of your own home. You know, it gets very 1984-ish very quickly, uh, my allusion to the uh, uh, novel. So the problem is that not only do, you know, is that a, a, a big problem in China where, you know, where just people's freedoms are highly repressed by the use of these digital means. And you, you know, you, you, you get on the sort of, low social credit rating score uh, in China. You know, you might not be able to buy a house. You might not be able to get a job. Um, the consequences of it are quite severe. But the flip side is they're exporting that technology and know-how to other countries that want to be or are authoritarian for how they can use it. And the real danger is, honestly, which we're, you know, we're seeing is, you know, what if, some foreign adversary decides that it's going to put surveillance on Americans, uh, Americans living abroad, or maybe even Americans in the United States, and they're going to use that surveillance to do harm to Americans, to try to either suppress their free speech or worse. I mean, you know, there was a story in the paper uh, a week or two ago about someone who had a hacking glitch. No, in other words, they weren't hacked. They had just a software glitch in their Tesla. And it took three hours to get them from being unlocked. Un they were locked in their car by accident and they couldn't get out of their car, even though they were in the car and they had you know, the ignition. So they were unable to unlock their car. So you can imagine if we're someday going to, soon, you know, going to go to robot taxis, which they're already using in Arizona, that are going to pick you up. There's no driver. There's no steering wheel. You're just in the back seat of this machine. And, you know, it's digitally programmed because you pushed a button in your phone that said you wanted to go to a certain place. Well, you know, what if the government of uh, Russia decides they don't want you to go to that place? You know, we have to know that that won't happen. And part of knowing that won't happen is for the United States to st stand up and have not only superior technology, and superior encryption and superior privacy and superior uh, uh, cyber defense. It's also about showing the world how these technologies need to be regulated to make them safe for freedom of expression, for uh, our democratic values and for safety and for environmental performance. Which is a huge challenge Right, he's just just a huge challenge, and uh, well, know. there were 16, 16 bills this week, or seventeen bills in front of the U.S. Congress today, on this subject of privacy and cyber. Well, so let, at, let, at least we're starting to focus on it, but we're nowhere near a solution. Yeah, finally starting to focus on it. Um, all right, I want to I want to move on to uh, an area that uh, both of us are. Uh, very familiar with. Uh, we both came up from uh, not the the, uh, the petroleum area, 
uh, the less than sunny side of the street. You, you've you've turned green, Amy. Um, we're we're still doing uh, petroleum analysis at uh, at CRG, but uh, I know you follow the the, the markets very, very carefully. Um, and, and what I wanted to talk about, uh, really, and you and you talked about it in the book. You write about energy investor dystopia. And I wanted to ask you, well, what does that mean, particularly vis-a-vis the majors? And I also want to talk about uh, OPEC. And if you were advising uh, OPEC uh, right now, would you tell them to play the short high price game that, that they're playing right now or uh, concentrate on uh, the longer game and li- start liquidating their, their reserves um, you know, right now, actually. So the, if you could talk about the, those two things, uh, that would be great. Well, so the first thing that I think we're seeing you know, already is as investors start thinking about what we call transition risk or climate risk, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, own stocks and bonds, and I'm going to, let's say I'm, you know, I, I'm, we're talking about my pension funds, so I'm not just you know, a day trader like some of your firm's clients. Say I'm just you know, in for the long haul, I'm going to have my portfolio, and I want to hold it for 20 or 30 years and have it provide a return. You know, investors have become concerned about whether or not the different energy companies, you know, do they have a forward-looking capital deployment strategy that is such that's going to continue to yield return over time, and um, and they're not going to be left with you know unmonetizable assets. So what do I mean by that? Like, you know, I say I was an oil company today, and I announced I'm going out tomorrow, and I'm going to drill for oil in Alaska. That's going to be very high cost oil. It's I have to worry about what permafrost melting would mean for my physical facilities, right? And um, and it's going to take me, you know, five or ten years to even start my oil production. Will there be demand for it uh, as we move to sort of a decarbonization pathway? So, so if you're an investor, you know, you might say to yourself, "Geez, like." I don't want to be holding, having my money, my pension money, or my long-term investment money in a company that's got a lot of, most of its profits or all of its profits or some high proportion of its profits are coming from Alaska, because I just don't think that's going to be a good investment. And so what you started to get was, you know, these sort of combination effects. First, you got some groups that just said, listen, I'm not skilled enough to know what companies are in the Canadian oil sands, which is another very expensive place, or what companies are in the Arctic. So I'm just going to divest from oil and gas companies completely. Um, And then you have other investors that are a little more sophisticated, and they go to these companies and they say, listen, we're thinking of dumping your stock, but we'd like to know what's your plan? You know, are you aligned with the energy transition that scientists are saying we need to make? Do you have a scientific plan for how you're going to shift your capital over time? And what are you going to do about your legacy assets? And as that, moment, as that movement has gained momentum, you're seeing companies take serious changes to how they invest. And then you're seeing other companies not take such serious changes and their stock price has gone way down. And so in the, in the complex as a whole, you know, since the Paris Accord, and of course, you know, gaining some momentum now is, as um, the U.S. policy has changed, the percentage that energy companies used to be in value terms in the uh, S&P 500 was about 10%. It's maybe a little bit higher in years when, you know, energy prices were high. Now it's 3%. And indeed, Exxon, you know, lost its place in the Dow Industrial Average. And they're now no longer a part of that uh, cluster. And, you know, Tesla and Apple and other companies like that have higher 
market capitalization than Exxon. And so we're really seeing sort of a changed investment profile. And that raises some questions about whether there'll be enough capital um, to continue to fund oil and gas development or whether the energy transition might be forced by the fact that people stop investing, which we're seeing somewhat in coal in the United States and might begin to see in coal in other countries over time. Been a lot of announcements this year by banks and other institutions that they're no longer going to uh, lend money to coal, for coal. So we're really sort of in, that's part of the energy transition is the transition on the finance side. Now, what does that mean for OPEC? It hasn't yet affected um, how investors see bonds from uh, oil producing countries, but one would imagine that someday it might, depending on the country. And, and it does cause a conundrum for OPEC, as you described, because if OPEC puts the price very high today and you know, people say, geez, this is crazy. I'm going to get an electric car or this is crazy. I'm not going to spend that on gasoline. I'm just going to have Amazon deliver that to my house. You know, you start to get to a picture where we know how we would eliminate oil demand, you know, fairly in, in ways that are not as inconvenient as they used to be. It may be in ways we might have been inclined to do anyway. And so the effect on OPEC of letting its price be high is that you're going to get a demand correction faster than you might have, might have otherwise. So then that asks the question, well, geez, does that mean that like OPEC should keep the price low? We have two problems. Number one, problem number one is the OPEC countries you know, basically need the money. So that's, that's uncomfortable to keep the price low. Um, and then the second problem is, to the extent that you're an OPEC country and you want to take a forward-looking view of your own future, you might want to be thinking about how you're going to pivot your economy to be less dependent on oil revenue. And then having low revenue to in reinvest is also a problem. So it, today would not be an easy time to be a policymaker in a petrostate because the choices are very challenging. Amy, you know what? On that note, we have reached the end of our, our podcast. Um, again, I want to say that the book is terrific. The name of the book is uh, Energy's Digital Future by Amy Jaffe. It's available on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble. And of course, um, Commodity Research Group can be reached on commodityresearchgroup.com. And Jim and I will be uh, having our usual fundamental discussion uh, coming up. Amy, I really can't thank you enough. This has been uh, a, a great discussion. And you've given our listeners a, a lot to think about. So uh, again, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.